Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and welcome to our post Open Access Week Open Access Week event, which is uh, brought to you jointly by Carnegie Mellon University Libraries and the University Library System at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. I am hoping and sensing there will be a lot of people following the streaming of this event, and I encourage you and anyone who's listening to the streaming to send questions to my Twitter account, um, and that way I don't have to make it up once we move into the discussion after the presentations. We've brought together four outstanding panelists who represent a number of key players engaged in the transformation of scholarly communication in a way that takes advantage of the opportunities brought by new technologies. More importantly, as we see funders and research organizations come together to address the major global challenges of the 21st century, and to do so in ways that don't damage the 22nd century, we see demands for greater openness to foster collaboration and to create an informed citizenry, all striving together to improve the economic, social, and health well-being of our planet. We'll learn from our speakers some of the innovative approaches being taken to shape the way in which scholars communicate with each other, with policymakers and government, and with the world at large. We'll also hear about some of the policy and advocacy work being undertaken alongside business innovations. I'm going to invite each of our four speakers to make opening remarks around about 10 minutes each, although at least four of them have said 10 minutes might stretch to 15, but we'll try and keep them under control. And then we'll open up, um, invite the panel to sit at the front for discussion. Uh, our first speaker, who I'll introduce in just a moment, Peter Binfield, uh, will be leaving a little bit early because he's got to get across the country to give another address tomorrow morning and has to make his flight. Uh, our four speakers um, will present in alphabetical order because I couldn't think of a logical flow other than alphabetical. Firstly, we'll have Peter Binfield, who is co-founder and publisher of PRJ. Peter has 20 years of experience in the academic publishing world. He started off with a PhD in optical physics and has held positions at the Institute of Physics, Kluwer Academics, Springer, SAGE, and most recently at PLOS, where he ran PLOS One and turned it into the mega journal that we all know and love today. There's been a, a bit of debate over the last few days about whether Peter will perform in song rather than in voice, um, but the enough money came in to ask you to speak rather than sing. Uh, Peter will be followed by Rachel Barley. Rachel is Vice President and Director of Open Access at Wiley. Rachel joined Wiley in 2007 to be publisher of Current Protocols and more recently a portfolio of Life Sciences journals. Um, Rachel moved into the Open Access role full time in 2012. Before that, she worked with Nature in a variety of publishing roles. Our third speaker will be Jennifer Lynn from PLOS. Um, she's passionate about open access and the broader political and social impacts that the disruption it might bring will afford. Uh, Jennifer was formerly a business consultant with Accenture and worked with a number of Fortune 500 companies and governments to develop and deploy a range of products and services. Jennifer's PhD is in political philosophy and she has taught at Johns Hopkins. And our fourth speaker is Dr. Marianne Martone. Uh, she is co-director of the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging at UC San Diego. She joined the Department of Neurosciences there in 1993, where she is currently a professor in residence. She is principal investigator of the NIF project, the Neuroscience Information Framework. Um, which is trying to arrive at uniform resource description activities in the field of neurosciences. But Marianne is here today to represent Force 11, a community of scholars, librarians, publishers, and research funders that has come together to facilitate the change toward improved knowledge creation and sharing that we can bring about through the modern scholarly communications that I mentioned earlier and through the effective use of information technology. All of this is driven by a sense of 
open access has been around for a few years, and to my mind, certainly, and I invite the panelists to reflect on this, it is a step on the road towards open science. And over the next 20 years, journal articles, whether open or closed, will be surrounded by a range of other communication artifacts. And as that moves towards a more open environment, we will get a sense that that part of useful knowledge, which is shareable, will grow, hopefully dramatically, and um, allow us to create that informed citizenry that I described earlier. And in turn, help us to meet the aims of research funders who collectively, if you do a snapshot of all of their mission statements and strategic plans, say that they're in the business of fostering public engagement with research, amongst other things. And that brings me to my closing point, which is about why open access is an important part of that journey towards open science. Because the traditional subscription models for the journal literature whilst meeting the needs of most of the research community, pretty much exclude those in industry and government who are making the policies that change our lives, and certainly exclude a lot of the public at large who deserve access to the best research that is out there. So with that in mind, I'm going to invite Peter to speak. We'll then just keep things running along one after the other in alphabetical order, and then we will join you at the front of the stage at the end of the four presentations. So, Peter, welcome. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, so I'm Pete Binfield, and I used to, used to run PLOS One. Um, I started, PLOS, well, started working on PLOS One when it was publishing about uh, 600 articles a year, I think. And then, as of last year, 2013, I think it published uh, 37,000 articles. So, PLOS One has grown dramatically, and, and it sort of spawned this uh, concept of the mega journal, which of course is being talked about a lot more. So I'm going to talk briefly about the, the mega journal and the growth of the mega journal and, and what that's doing to the market, and then I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, sort of change tack entirely and talk about open access and how a culture of openness actually sort of begets uh, improvements in the process. And then I'm going to be talking more about PJ. Um, and PJ is the journal, the publisher that I co-founded with Jason Hoyt from uh, Ex Mendeley. Uh, I left PLOS One to, to co-found that, and, and we're, we're trying to outdo PLOS One at its own game. So, so this is a graph, and, and you may not be able to see the lines very clearly, um, but it's a graph I put together last year uh, to show the growth of the, the mega journal model. And it was a presentation I did actually up at UBC, British Columbia. You could, you could Google it and get a lot of the background for this talk. But um, the point I was trying to make was that a lot of people focus on the growth of PLOS One uh, year over year. And this data is a little bit old, goes through 2012. But the red line in the corner is the growth of PLOS One year over year, the publication output of PLOS One. Um, and the addition from the blue line is PLOS One plus all the PLOS One clones. Uh, of which PJ is one, but also Nature's Scientific Reports is a, a very prominent one, the BMJ Open, Sage Open. There, there's a number of journals that have launched in the last five years that are attempting to be plus one for their field. So that blue line is plus one plus all of those other journals. Now, the, the interesting thing, the real innovation of plus one was its uh, approach to the editorial criteria of peer reviewing and evaluating the content. So... PLOS One's, I think, conceptual breakthrough that it managed to make a success was that it would peer review scientific content only for rigor, um, methodology, and soundness. Uh, does this work deserve to be in the scientific literature? Does it meet all the minimum bars for reporting? And, and, and you know, Does the data follow the experimental method? Do the conclusions follow the data? Are the statistics good? So it looks at all of those kind of things, but it doesn't ask uh, how impactful is this work? How... How sexy is it? Uh, what degree of advance it is? What is the readership of, of this article? So PLOS One, because it covers all of biology and medicine, doesn't need to ask what is the readership, and it certainly doesn't need to ask what is the impact, and so on. But, but it turns out that sort of stealthily, um, underneath the radar almost, because everyone's focused on PLOS One, there's a whole class of journals that basically apply the same editorial criteria as PLOS One, but in niche areas. So they're not the large mega journal that PLOS One has become, but they cover a specific subject area, the, the 
Frontiers in Neurorobotics, for example, is one of these journals. It only publishes work in neurorobotics, whatever, whatever that might be. We may hear later. But um, uh, so I think that the interesting thing there is that uh, it applies the same editorial criteria of uh, soundness, robustness, you know, it is a uh, work to be published. Um, but it'll never grow that large because there's not that much work in neurorobotics. But it turns out that all of the journals, the Frontiers journals, uh, most of the Hindawi journals and most of the Biomed Central journals effectively apply this sort of non-impact related editorial criteria. And when you throw them into the mix, that's the, the upper line, they basically double the volume of content being published under this sort of impact neutral editorial model. And I think that, that sort of top line is the one that a lot of people have missed because they focus on the plus one line. But actually what you see there is in 2012, roughly 50,000 articles were published in the world in 2012. In 2013, you can see this curve is basically almost doubling every year. So I don't know what it was in 13 or it'll be in 14, but conceivably this year there's, there's more than 100,000 articles being published in the world for which no determination has been made via the peer review or selection process as to the, their impact, their quality, their sexiness, their degree of advance, uh, things like that. Um, so I think the, the PLOS One model and the, the other journals that, that use it in various flavors, I think it's a real success of the open access movement. It's really changed, I think, the way people think um, of, of open access content. And we can debate whether that's in a good or a bad way. Um, but I think it's, it's changed the, the game for uh, how to reuse this content now. There's now a, a large chunk of the open access literature, probably more than half the open access literature is in this model, which makes up a very big chunk of the global literature, for which people are now going to have to figure out, well, actually, how good or bad was that article? And that's then spawned things like article-level metrics and so on. So that's that. And then changing tack entirely, just to talk about PeerJ, um, I think one of the things we've done with PeerJ is we've, we've tried to start with a, a mindset that the, uh, the community is becoming more open. Um, so they're more... Um, happy about sharing and acting in a sort of open way. Um, and, you know, and you can see that in the world with people using Facebook and, and tweeting their thoughts openly to the world. You know, just the, the, the global community is heading in this direction and the open access movement has sort of pushed the academic community along this way. So with that mindset in place, how can we develop incentive structures or uh, functionality within our ecosystem that uh, incentivizes more openness. You know, if, if you are open and you act openly in our system, do you get greater <coughs> benefits accruing back to you? And so we've built a, an ecosystem that when you look at it, there, there are various points where we've done exactly that. Um, and the preprint server is one example. So we've, we have a preprint server, um, and that's unpeer reviewed content. It basically goes online immediately, but it's online and openly available. Um, preprints, uh, there, there is evidence to suggest that if you publish a preprint, you get more citations for your peer-reviewed version. Um, by publishing your preprint, you can get feedback from the community, earlier feedback, sort of pre-publication peer review almost, but feedback from the community that you can then use in a submission to a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and so we're, we're seeing people submit to the preprint server, leaving it there for a couple of months, getting some comments, improving the paper, and then sending it onto the journal. And that's getting content out there easier, quicker, faster, and, and freely. This is entirely free to use the preprint server. We're trying to incentivize that right now, for example, with um, if you submit a paper to the preprint server, you actually get your publication in the journal for free. So again, we're trying to incentivize this sort of virtuous behavior from people. Another way we do it is with what we're calling contribution points. So Whenever you take an action in our system, if you're an author, a reviewer, an editor, if you make a comment, if you answer a question, if you get your question voted up, voted down, you get points. And these points at the moment don't, don't mean anything. The points don't add up to a free flight or anything. <laughs> so, but um, but the, you can see, the, and if you can read this, and you can check all this out on our website, but you'll see that we've structured this point system uh, so as to try and incentivize good behavior. If you're more open, if you're a peer reviewer that provides your name, you get more points than if you're a peer reviewer who remains anonymous, for example. Um, if you're somebody who contributes to the community by leaving a good answer on somebody's question, your answer got voted up, you get more points than somebody who left a bad answer. And, and so again, at the moment this is early days because our database of interactions is somewhat small. You know, the network effect hasn't kicked in yet, but the intention is that by having this infrastructure in place, we're incentivizing people to do the right thing in the system. And then my last slide, but one, <laughs> basically related, 
Uh, the other thing that we do is uh, optional open peer review, which I think is quite interesting. So we provide uh, reviewers, and actually that would be this slide, we provide reviewers with the option to name themselves in the system so they can provide their name to the authors, and if they do, they get points, um, and then they'll, they'll end up with um, a review being credited against their profile. And what it's optional, so we just wanted to see if it, there was good uptake or not, and this is the percentage uptake per... Um, recommendation type for their review, which I think is very interesting. If, if you're providing a, a positive review, you're happy to give your name, a negative review, you're happy to stay anonymous. And sort of a stunning finding in human psychology, but, um, but the, the overall is about 40%. So I think the fact that 40% of reviewers are, are voluntarily happy to give their name is interesting. And the other half of our open peer review system is that uh, authors are given the option to make their entire peer review history publicly available. Um, so when their paper is published, they can click a switch and the uh, submission, the review comments, the editor decision letter, the rebuttal letter, the revision again, everything is made public. And at the moment, um, just over 80% of authors are choosing to do this. And again, you know, that's, I think that's a higher percentage than we we're expecting. And it shows that um, you know, if you provide the open tools, people will adopt them. Um, the, the great benefit of doing this is, for instance, authors can now prove to the world that their work was peer-reviewed. You know, there's the predatory journal problem of um, publishing papers that were never peer-reviewed. Now they can, you know, with our system, just flick a switch and see here, here is the peer review. And then when you go to the profile page for that peer reviewer, you can click through and see that open peer review because they provided their name, the authors made the review openly available, and now you can see everything that went on and, and credit it back to the, the right person. So... Those are some of the ways that we're trying to incentivize openness. And that's about my 10 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rachel Burley, and I'm, as Keith so very eloquently introduced me, I'm Wiley's Director for Open Access. Um, and I just wanted to very briefly give some opening remarks to talk about the um, publishing activities from um, one of the larger traditional publishers like Wiley and to talk a little bit more about how we're adapting for a more open um, publishing environment. So many of you will be familiar with Wiley and um, some of the journals we publish. We publish 1,650 journals across all scholarly disciplines. Um, and over half of those are on behalf of um, scholarly societies, um, again, across a, a wide variety of disciplines. So that's our traditional business, um, but I was um, Director of Open Access initially in 2011, and it was about that time that um, we recognized that there was a growing need to provide more opportunities for authors to publish open, gold open access. Um, and or, while we have the hybrid option in subscription journals which allow people to make their papers open, um, there was a growing demand, um, as Pete's demonstrated as well, for fully open access journals. So we now have um, 54 fully open access journals and um, in fact Marianne is editor of one of those. It's the first time we met today but it was quite nice, um, of Brain and Behaviour which is one of those. Um, and this is a really healthy, vibrant program um, of journals, but in fact, the majority of open access papers that we publish at Wiley are hybrid open access in subscription journals. So I mentioned the 1,650 journals. Of those, about 85% offer the option to an open access option, um, and it's called online open in our journals. So to look at the uptake of this, um, I just thought I would show you the percentage of content that this represents for Wiley published journals on Wiley Online Library. Um, so in 2012, it was a relatively small number um, of papers. We published about 150,000 research papers in that year, and less than 1% of them were open <coughs> access. Um, that number has grown significantly, and it's partly driven by the, the funders um, who are in some European countries um, asking authors to publish and asking them to go for the gold option first. So this year we're likely to publish about 10,500, um, so it's a big growth area. 
It's still primarily in the life and health sciences. Um, about 80% of the papers we publish are in those two disciplines. Um, there is a growing interest in some of the social sciences and humanities um, and the physical sciences, but it's still fairly low, um, less than 20%. And in some fields, there just isn't really um, the funding to pay for the gold open access. And in those fields, then the authors tend to self-archive if there's a funder requirement to do that. So just to give you a couple of statistics from our author survey in 2013. So we, we asked um, we asked 107,000 Wiley authors. We had about 8,500 that responded. Um, and there were 59% of them said that they had published an open access paper in the previous year. Um, that was over double the number that had answered the same question in 2012. So we really, it's really a very small number of authors now that have not published an open access article. Um, these actually, these are all the slides, full slide set for these survey results are in SlideShare, um, and so you, it, there's a lot of information there for anybody who, who's interested in it. Um, but interestingly, you know, I mean the. The, all the traditional factors that authors use in deciding where to publish still exist. Um, and for those that, who did publish um, open access, that the things that they want to, to help them make the decision about where to publish are, are these things here on the left. So they're still looking for high impact factor. Um, they want the journal to be well regarded by their peers. They're looking for high quality. Um, and then for those who have not published open access, there are still some lingering kind of old-fashioned reasons, I think, as to why they're not. Um, I don't think willingness to pay is old-fashioned, actually, but I think some of the things around quality are, um, you know, partly linked perhaps to the, the predatory publishers that have emerged, um, but also just a lingering feeling that maybe open access isn't, doesn't have the same quality as subscription journals. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, this partly may in fact be linked to the fact that we're just publishing a lot more, as Pete has, has demonstrated. And the role of the traditional journal has been to, you know, kind of judge the novelty of papers as well as just the technical soundness of it. And I think for some authors, they're still looking for that. So we did also um, ask where they'd published open access. And I was, you know, I was quite surprised to see the large number that had not paid an article publication charge. Although I shouldn't have been, because in fact, if you look in the directory of open access journals, there's a large number of the 10,000 journals in there that just don't charge a fee, and you can publish free. Um, and the majority of authors are choosing to publish in fully open access journals. So uh, this is not just for Wiley, this is across all, um, all journals. And so I kind of, I know we're going to come on to talking about the future, so I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to sort of, is that squashed, that globe? <laughs> um, I mean, I think what will be interesting is to see, we have all the foundation for, for a large amount of change, I think, and open access has driven that, and I think, um, you know, there's going to be a lot more, and, I, and what I'm going to be interested to see is, is there going to be something even more radical? Um, some of the things that we're looking at at Wiley are just, you know, how can we make the whole publication process much faster and much easier and more streamlined for authors? And ultimately, you could imagine a world in which research results are communicated by blogs or, you know, something that's very quick and easily updated. So I'm looking forward to that part of the discussion. And at that point, I'll hand over to Marianne. Oh, sorry, to um, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to take a step back um, and ask um, a couple of questions that really get us to think about what is open access. What are the aims, what are the end goals of open access? Why open? Originally, when our very first journal, PLOS, started, um, what is coming up to about 11 years ago, PLOS Biology, it was founded by a set of researchers who were very frustrated that um, their access to read other people's research um, was not immediate and what is, was, they were not freely available. Um, that it was a particular inefficiency in their own research pursuits. So with that note, 
um, I'd like to think more about efficiencies, about how open access kind of fits into this ultimate larger aim. We know that efficiencies are quite deep, expansive, um, and they go beyond actually just trying to get access to the narrative itself. Um, that's a big part of doing your research. Um, and it's also a, a tremendous part of finding the research that you need. Commun communicating the research results is also an inefficiency. We have heard over and over again that researchers are very much bogged down by um, these difficult sy submission systems by the process of authoring when it's a collaborative research project that spans the globe, et cetera. The, um, all of these things are keeping them from doing the other work that they're supposed to be doing, which may entail continuing with other projects, moving on to other projects, um, other also very important parts of scholarly contributions, um, such as doing peer review, um, also very important teaching. And fourthly, another deep inefficiency that we've been seeing um, with the conversations we've had with the community really involve researchers struggling to be able to provide evidence um, of their expertise, of their contributions as members of the scholarly community. And what I'd like to suggest is that if we think about open access, um, more broadly speaking, as an open access framework, then perhaps we can start to build towards that future where we, f where we gain efficiencies across all of these areas. So the, the open access, um, gold open access that we've spoken of, um, thanks to Rachel and to Pete, um, making articles freely and immediately available upon publication. That is an efficiency for readers, right? Authors, um, excuse me, researchers are readers. Um, um, educators are readers. Policymakers are readers. The lay public are readers. Um, that the, the, there are many people who might be considered part of this reader role. Um, another aspect in which we feel that readers can gain efficiencies in accessing not just the narrative, um, but the, da the data underlying the narrative um, come with um, data policy, data access policies, or data ac access mandates. But thinking beyond the article itself, the, the whole experience of writing this up, as I mentioned already, there are many things that we can build towards in order to make authoring, the, the submission of and the packaging up together of the research narrative um, faster, quicker, easier, end game, more efficient. Um, and another third area in which we think that efficiencies can be gained really relate to the latter two bullet points, especially the last one that I mentioned in that last slide, which not only helps funders, institutional administrators, from those of you who are part of tenure and promotion committees, hiring committees, um, but also policymakers at the government level, et cetera, is to be able to provide either metrics or qualitative um, commentary about the research, whether it be, be just of the research narrative itself or associated with any of the other scholarly outputs. Making that available openly um, and easily findable and building tools that can allow these individuals to be able to do whatever they need to do in order to get their job done. That is a type of efficiency that I think is also a really important part of the open access framework. So as I was saying, this framework has multiple vectors. And just to sum it up, um, access to the research articles, we've laid the foundation for it, and um, we're, we're continuing to build on that. That is a really critical component, at, but just the first step. The data evaluation of the content and metrics that provide evidence of contribution. Um, I'll just try to quickly move through some of the aspects um, that relate to PLOS itself. Um, the open access piece, um, that much is, is pretty obvious since that's why we were started. Um, as of March of this year, we made a, um, a, a policy update requiring that all articles submitted to PLOS um, have data deposited and made publicly available, with rare exception, those being when there's perhaps patient um, privacy data, if there's third party data, et cetera. But we do firmly believe, especially with PLOS One, as a foundational piece of our corpus that if um, the community and specifically editors and reviewers are checking first and foremost for methodological soundness, how are they going to do this without access to the data? And then after publication for the entire community. 
Um, this article was published today. Um, I encourage you to go check it out on PLOS Biology. It's a set of recommendations that the community has offered um, for directly speaking to publishers. This came out of a meeting um, that a group of people organized last year, actually. Um, and originally, that set of people were, it was made up of data center heads, policymakers all over the world. Um, um, they came up with these recommendations. This was circulated amongst the community, provided feedback, and this, um, these are the final recommendations that have come out of these discussions. It is the author's hopes, in fact, though, that this kicks off another set of and continued conversations involving publishers, involving far more stakeholders um, across, the, across the world. Um, so do check it out if, if you have time. I spoke of making the um, commentary on the research articles also available. This is you know, a, a tremendous advance that PRJ has offered as well as other publishers. We at PLOS, we absolutely um, support this. We do think that not only is the research itself you know, the output of valuable work, but all of the work that um, has been done by editors, by reviewers, et cetera, um, those labors are lost when they're locked in, locked in the vault and never brought along um, that which is appropriate and relevant, et cetera. All of these layers of commentary we do feel when packaged together sensibly um, can actually be quite an enrichment to the research narrative itself. Making that open is, is, is a part of the open framework story. And the metrics, I'll um, try to wrap up. The metrics surrounding what happens to the articles once they have been published. We do feel that this is not only um, of great interest to the researchers themselves, which, who traditionally publish, forget about it, and they just think, oh, it's out in the world somehow. But you know, we all know that the reality is that we have to provide evidence of our work, not just that we publish the paper, or may, perhaps a little bit down the line, say three to four years later, um, when the community starts writing up their research and citing it, but also you know, a, a, an entire range of other ways in which the community is engaging, reusing this research, et cetera. These indicators are very powerful beginnings of, of understanding um, the, re, the reach and the reuse of, of, of scholarly research. Um, some of the work that we're doing now is to move this um, effort, which has been at least to this point, um, which Pete Benfield um, um, alluded to with article level metrics. It's been a kind of a cottage effort with a number of smaller publishers, but um, we are working with Crossref to build this out to be um, an, an industry-wide system making all of these metrics for all published articles that are part of Crossref um, freely available to everyone. And we're building out tools that allow people to be able to easily report off of a single article, off of collections of articles, et cetera. And um, the pilot with Crossref um, that we've begun, has, we've started off with a small set of, of sources um, that track research articles. And we've built a little tool called Periscope um, for those of you interested in actually plumbing into that data. It's periscope.io periscope for, um, for the URL if you're interested allowing you to be able to um, get the data, visualize it, um, et cetera. But all of this plumbing, um, just to wrap up, is really, really important. It's community infrastructure. Uh, many of us publishers are working to build that. But it really, really does not, um, it, it, we, we, it's not in place, basically, until something like this looks like this. And researchers are able to do their work. So um, how can you as researchers or institutional administrators um, support and um, usher in the adoption of the open access framework and the establishment of the open access framework. All of these things um, that really ref um, relate back to the, my original slide, publish in an OA journal, make your um, research open access, but also make your data available. Contribute to open peer reviews and demand metrics, um, open metrics that capture your, the reach of your articles. And just to sum up, you know, the open access framework is collective benefits. Um, but if you want to talk in economics terms, there's local benefits and then there's global benefits. And I do firmly believe that the open access framework provides for both. Thank you very much.
Is this on? Press the space bar. Space bar. Oh, there we go. Very good. Um, thank you. Apparently, this is one of my uh, standard titles, which is, uh, as <laughs> Keith indicated, I'm here on behalf of Force 11, the future of research communications and e-scholarship. And many people say, well, are we in the future already, or are we still trying to invent it? And so <laughs> that's where the title comes from. Uh, so I thought I'd start off by telling you a little bit about Force 11, and then also our interest and my own interest as to why I came to Force 11. As you heard from my biography, I am a, a, actually a research scientist, an active research scientist. Um, but I think in the sciences in particular, um, my personal experience really drove me to open access and why I consider it so important. Um, but just as a background, Force 11, um, as he indicated, was a, is a, is a <coughs> grassroots organization. It was actually founded by uh, Phil Bourne, who recently went off to be director of data sciences at the NIH, and a lot of people from publishing computer science cross-disciplinary group who came together originally in 2011 at a meeting called Beyond the PDF, where we realized that there was a lot of pent-up frustration in the research community about the current narrowness and inefficiencies in our scholarly publishing. A pipeline. This was driven largely by the biomedical sciences, but it was really transdisciplinary uh, because this was being felt throughout people, whether they're in the humanities or what have you. And we realized that there had been sort of very narrow roles where everybody thought, of course, that they were the only ones thinking about this. But you realize that in your life as a researcher, there was a time where you used to spend a lot of time in the library, and you might even go to a reference librarian to get to some of those indexes. But now, of course, the only indication you have of your library is by what subscriptions you can get to it. Very rarely do you actually go in and interact with librarians. And you almost never interacted with publishers. We found out publishers largely interact with the libra librarians because they're the ones who purchase the subscriptions. And the sort of new world that we had of networked information was really sort of changing those relationships, and groups were coming in contact, and roles were being merged that had never been merged before. And we realized there really was no organization that allowed all of these different stakeholders to come together, not just in the sciences, but in the social sciences and the humanities and um, in industry as well. So it's a broad tent organization really designed for anybody who has a stake in moving scholarly communication forward. And uh, Force 11 uh, started off with a grand vision. There was the Force 11 Manifesto, as uh, these organizations often create. And it's online, and you can read it. But it basically was around a set of visions about the impact and the potential impact of technology and information technology to really transform the way that we do and think about things. And so I'm not going to go through each one individually, but you see number two is we see a future in which scientific information and scholarly communication more generally become part of a global, universal, and explicit network of knowledge. And that sounds a lot like kind of, you know, the internet, it sounds like things like semantic web. But what it basically says is Force 11, because it's a broad tent organization, doesn't take a firm stance on open access. However, you can't have that unless you have access to all of the information. And that's really going to be the theme of my talk. So as I've come to uh, interact with everybody inside of Force 11, I have started to see the problems facing modern uh, science and what have you less in terms of, I started off in databases and how you make scientific information available in databases. But you started to realize that there's actually what I call a duality to modern scholarship that heretofore we have not had. And that is the fact that there are humans and their machines who are both consumers of information. And whereas before, the scholar, the human being, was the sole integrator in a lifetime of information, of, of reading and interacting and soaking it up, that now the agent of synthesis and integration is no longer solely the human. It is, in fact, a human working with and through some sort of automated agent, some sort of thing that's going to crunch it and give the information to you. You don't flip through books anymore. You don't flip through issues of journals. You go to search engines. You go to Google to find your information. And this is a huge transformation because our whole scholarly system has been geared towards communicating with other human beings. And so a lot of what we do is really about um, looking to say, how are we going to let our colleagues know? How are we going to let um, you know, our, our colleagues know what we have? How are we going to be rewarded? But it's really clear that at least in the sciences, the unit of scholarship is actually very small. One of the reasons we think that perhaps open access has not been such an issue in, say, the humanities is there they publish books. 
and a book is a large unit of scholarship that is meant in many ways to be self-contained. The research article, especially in biomedicine, is small. It is a tiny piece of an interconnected network. No individual can get all of that information anymore. You need a Watson or something else that can go across 23 million articles and synthesize that and put it together. And I really came to information technology when I was trying to gather enough information to create a model of how a synapse worked. And it took a team of people two years going through the literature, going back and trying to read these things to extract these little nuggets of information. It is meant to be put together. So how did I come to open access in particular? I actually have both a human and a machine story. The human story is one that often many people here may have had, and that is my own experience with illness and trying to get information. So my parents, uh, we, uh, cousins and things, I get all of these requests all of the time. They're, they're, they're sick. But there was a time when I remember my mom was really sick and I had to make decisions. I had to make decisions for her health care that required me getting to the scientific literature. And I was sending all those articles to my brother and they kept coming back. How come I have to pay $30 for this? How come I have to pay $30 for it? And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. I have to download the PDF and package and send it to you. And I could do that. But if you listen to a lot of people who came to open access, they say, oh, but we realize that this is beyond most people's capacity. They cannot get to life-saving research. And even getting to it a year after it's published, in my view, is unacceptable. You have to make decisions now. You should get that information now. My machine-based one, though, is also a, a personal story. At the very first Beyond the PDF, I was off to do a sabbatical in something called the Spinal Muscular Atrophy Foundation. This is a ne fatal neurodegenerative disease of children. And I brought it up at this conference called Beyond the PDF, which I mentioned, which brought everybody together. And I said I was about to go off, and I would be happy to test all these new tools. And they said, oh, you know what? We can, we can do all our text mining and we can do all these cool things to help you find a cure for SMA. And I said, that's great. And then as I went off, you realized immediately something about the scientific corpus that I think is not appreciated. It is fragmented and is not fragmented in any orderly way. There are 25 million articles total, each one of them covering a fragment of the space, but each publisher owns a fragment of a particular domain. So even in a relatively small corpus like SMA, there were at least eight or nine publishers. And by the time we tried to negotiate all the rights to get all the rights to the content, my sabbatical was over and there was nothing we could do. And we know that this happens all the time. You know, here again, <laughs> SMA, search. PubMed, no access, Elsevier, Oxford, Embo, you know, PubMed Central. And so whether we like it or not, we're going to have to figure out how to get universal access, not to the PDFs that we have to extract and, and, and turn into XML, but to the underlying XML. So one of my big uh, you know, hobby horses and the things in my soapbox is we need some way of negotiating universal access to the biomedical literature. You should not be able to publish in the biomedical literature unless you make access to this. And this was just something that I saw online recently. This has been my experience with UCSD. Many of the libraries, when they negotiated their deals with the publishers, did not get rights to the XML to be able to do this. In fact, it's explicitly in their contracts that you cannot use machine-based methods to get to the contract. And so I thought this was very good where they said our experience led us to realize that text mining rights of full text articles in XML format should routinely be included in the negotiation of the library's licenses. But of course I couldn't read the rest of this article because it was in closed access. <laughs> So what can we do if we have this type of access? I'm involved in several things in Force 11 to try to see how we're going to be able to get these changes in scholarly communication into the hands of the authors. And this was a very simple use case, which turned out almost, it was almost impossible to answer. And this was, what studies used a particular software tool, a particular database, a repository, an antibody, a genetically modified animal? And funders would like to know that because they're paying. People who build these tools would like to know. Authors would like to know to troubleshoot their experiments. And you'd like to be able to aggregate information around it. And we had NIH come to us and say, can we answer this question? And I said, no. I said, first of all, it turns out researchers are still writing for other human beings, so they don't put enough identifying information in their papers for you to be able to tell what it is that they use. Secondly. This is in the materials and methods. And in PubMed at the time, you could not get into the materials and methods. You could only get to the abstract. And so there was no way to get to that information. And finally, we know that we're dealing with a legacy of how many citation styles, right? How many citation styles? And so we said what we really need is a new system to identify research resources that is uniform across publishers 
outside of the paywall, <laughs> right? And it's somewhat machine processable. So we actually started a pilot project and because we were in Force 11 and we worked with the publishers, the librarians, the authors, we got a group of publishers together and we launched a project that had 30 journals that said, we're going to give unique identifiers to antibody software databases and genetically modified uh, animals. And the first results are actually in the literature. We have 170 articles of these from 29 journals. And what's interesting is somehow Google gets access to the full text, even though we can't get it otherwise. But if you type in an RRID, as we call them, into Google, you pull up a list of all the articles that actually published with this. So I think it's very, very important to remember that um, there are things that we can do now to sort of change it, that we have to think of this as an entire corpus and our whole relationship of how we view information getting into and out of has to change. Um, and also, though, that it requires everybody. It requires everybody, and when you get everybody on board, what I've really been pleased to find out in Force 11 is how many people working across all these stakeholder groups are really dedicated towards this change. So I just want to put in a plug for our meeting, which is no longer beyond the PDF because we feel we've actually moved beyond the PDF, and is now for 2015, which will be in Oxford in January. Thank you. Okay, so we've had four quick presentations. It's now your chance, the audience, either in the room or via Twitter to pose your questions, add to the conversation, elaborate on any of the points that were made by the speakers. So the first Twitter question I've got, I don't want to start with. <laughs> <laughs> These guys know it, and it will just take us in a, a different direction than um, where we want to go. Um, I'm not a technical person, and I don't attend CMU, but I do have a question. By providing open access, is there anyone that's going to lose money? Are, are publishers <laughs> going to lose money? <laughs> will there be any loss of money in any sector by providing open <laughs> Maybe we will get to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, go for it. Um, well, I mean, I think it's inevitable to a certain extent. I mean, if you know, open access, of course, has two forms. So there's the gold and the green. Um, and so, if, you know, publishers are generally supporting both. So widely support both. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the, you know, the proliferation of op gold open access journals and open access publishers means that the market has become very competitive. Um, and I think that's had the impact of, of forcing the price down. So I think you know, the answer to that question is yes. You know, I think it is. I think you can put some math on it. There's, um, <coughs> the STM publishing industry is about $10 billion a year, roughly and it publishes about a million journal articles a year, roughly. And the PLOS One price is $1,350 per article. So if you publish those million articles in PLOS One, it would cost the world $1.3 billion compared to the current $10 billion. You know, so, so just in those kind of ballpark numbers, you can see there's a potential for a dramatic cost saving, which equates to lost revenue for publishers, basically. Um, uh, another place which is interesting, which is one that I think some publishers have fought against, is... Um, commercial reprint revenue. So some publishers, some particular publications, get a lot of money by reproducing individual journal articles and selling them to a pharmaceutical company for them to take around all the doctors to sell drugs. And <coughs> Some publishers make a significant amount of money out of that. If those articles are published open access, you know, there's no revenue there for them as well. And just to clarify, these reprint services are to provide reprints on a per article request basis, right? I mean, because you could easily see that there could be, in fact, a very valuable service of aggregating, say, a set of articles together, collecting them and publishing them as a unit, right? That would be, that would be a value added, but, say, in a specific yeah. subspecialty field. That's a right? good point. Yeah, I sort of see where you're going. I mean, right, so with one hand you take and the other hand you give. I mean, there's, yeah. there's new opportunities for making revenue. Um, potentially, yet to be discovered. But yeah, it's not just a bleak bleak story of lost revenue for whole sectors in the industry. 
they could be creative and attempt to find new ways to make money off of this open content. But it's also true that it is real pressure on universities and researchers to pay for this. The author uh, pay charges are a contentious topic. And I remember at the last uh, Beyond the PDF conference, Dave DeRoer, who was both a funder and also you know, in the scholarly communication said, I'm very suspicious of these large round numbers that the open access journals seem to be charging. It was also clear from that that in the humanities and other places that are not as well funded as science and where they're not used to sort of subsidizing. We've always been used to subsidizing publication, especially if you come from microscopy, you always had to pay for color plates and other sorts of things. But it's not a model that a lot of places can, actually, a lot of fields can sustain. And there they move then towards these other mechanisms because they have to, which again is lost revenue for the publishers. But the pressures on the universities with subscription fees and others are also driving this as well. <clears throat> so one of the players that we haven't really touched on mm. in the landscape is the scholarly society. And mm. one of the crude business models there is that they have their flagship journals which are published by typically a commercial publisher and the society receives income which they use to do good things. If we move into a disruptive model where that system has changed, what is the substitution revenue for the learned society? Now, I did pose that question <laughs> in one of my previous universities where the vice chancellor said, in a forum like this, I'm not paying to subsidize societies. But it's an interesting dynamic that needs to be thought through. Well, I mean, I, I think that's right, actually. And in fact, I did. Um, I, I was involved in a webinar last week, which the topic of that was open access and scholarly societies. And I think, you know, there is um, many of the societies, their entire activities are funded by their publication program. And I think, you know, some of them are very um, large and have lots of other activities. And, you know, the kind of knock-on effect would, would probably not be so severe for them. But there are, I think there's quite a number that would... Um, struggle to provide the other activities like um, the education programs that they provide and the outreach so I think you know particularly in the UK um, I think there are some smaller societies that are concerned about that. I also think I mean we're talking again about publishing narratives and papers and, and figures and as Jennifer and others indicated that the world is changing in terms of what is considered scholarly output and though the current model may be overly expensive for even formatting, because we can do that ourselves with a good program now. I mean, the things that we used to add to text maybe aren't so hot, but there's a lot of other value you can add to these articles, especially in the area of multimedia, data, uh, software workflows. And it may be just like the, the societies which formed around these journals to help with dissemination very early on. It's actually the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society's journal this year um, in 2015, but it may be they need to reinvent themselves around these other products because these are still new. We don't really know what to do with them. We don't really know how to handle them, and, and right now you, you need a fairly robust infrastructure to be able to serve them. So I think that there are other opportunities that are going to come out as well, uh, and the Society should really be on the forefront of that. All the more so given that they have such a, they form, you know, their membership is based upon a particular strong community right, exactly. of researchers. In fact, you could argue that they know more about their researchers' needs than any of the other, say, stakeholders within the ecosystem, publishers included. Right. That, that is um, a, a benefit that I, I hope that they learn how to exploit. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they've been very slow societies. Oh, um, you know, and I've used this phrase before, they're addicted to the revenue that they get from commercial publishers for the privilege of publishing their journal. And, and that's now sort of ingrained in their mindset that this is the only way we can make money, and it's so much money, how can we possibly replace it with any other revenue source? And, and, and then you sort of step out of that sort of myopic society world, and, and, and you get to your dean. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's no inalienable right for a society you know, sitting in the UK doing a very worthy topic to get all its funding from libraries, you know, in the, another part of the world. I mean, libraries do not exist to fund societies. The society exists to um, meet the <coughs> needs of its members, which in the past was publishing a society journal. But I think they've sort of lost track because they're, they're really addicted to the revenue source they get. It could dry up.
quite quickly. Mm -hmm. There's something ironic about a panel dominated by Brits bad mouthing British societies, whilst <laughs> in the US, but never mind. <laughs> Other questions? Anna? Um, so, two questions, and one is more specific than the other, but both from uh, Peter's talk. Um, the first was the posting the preprints. What is the copyright issue there? Is, if you've already put it out and people already have it, if you went to a traditional journal with this, it has already been published. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about, and, and I'm, you know, it's great for people to be able, I'm, I'm very pro open access and I'm, you know, um, for a patient to be able to get articles, that's great. But as a coming at it from a researcher's perspective, having traditional journals has narrowed how many journals you have to monitor, right? I can, I have a set of 10 journals maybe that I check regularly and I look at all the papers and the table of contents in them. So if the last one is publishing 100,000 papers a year, it's great that the information is out there, but now, and then you add Twitter and blogs to it also, how do I tell the wheat from the chaff? What is the future light for that? For, you know, we're doing impact neutral reviewing, but somehow we still have to decide what has an impact. And yeah. Any thoughts on, on how we do that as a person confronted with all this information? So the first one's the easiest. Um, so the, the copyright license that the preprint server is under is a CC BY license, CC BY 4. So it's a regular open access copyright license. But your question really was whether other journals are happy to publish papers that have already appeared in print, effectively. Yeah, um, so I guess they're yeah. open access journal, they won't care. Well, um, but also, uh, you know, it's, it's now actually becoming almost probably the majority of journals are fine with this concept. You can go Google it. If you Google Wikipedia journal preprint policy, okay. um, there's a page, and for instance, I don't know, all of the journals of OUP, all of the journals of Elsevier Bar 2, um, you know, all of the journals of Springer, obviously the open access publisher. So vast swathes of the literature are now happy to publish papers that previously appeared as a preprint. So not so much an issue anymore. And often, actually, the holdouts tend to be these sort of society publishers that, that only have one journal that they care about, and they're not looking at the bigger picture. And they tend to be the ones that, I, I bet widely, most of the journals that don't allow that are probably the society journals. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that there's a big variety of policies. We, we don't have just one single policy because we publish on behalf of so many different yeah. partners. So then the second question, and it sort of comes back to, to your point down there, we're not publishing this content for people anymore and the ability for a person's personal <laughs> filtration mechanism, which was the journal infrastructure of 25,000 journals, and you know if it's good enough for that one, we'll publish it. If not, we'll reject it. And that was sort of just a human-mediated sort of filtration system that worked quite well you know, back in 300 years ago. <laughs> but now, of course, we're publishing for, for machines, really. So... So I think the answer to your problem is that you shouldn't, as a human, expect to only be able to read the top ten journals in your field and get a, a full picture of what's going on. You, you should expect Google to read every journal that's being published and, and filter it, or, or some service to filter it, to give you the stuff that's relevant to you. And those tools don't necessarily exist yet very well, but they're being developed. There's actually a lot of experimentation going on for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, I, Klaus could comment on that, I'm sure. Right. Yeah, just to add to mm -hmm. Pete's comment, um, what I would really like to see, and I think many of us as well, is uh, is the community spurring on innovation in this area of discovery. I think that traditionally, like you said, um, researchers just went to the top journals, say the vanity journals, and that was enough. But, you know, my argument is today that should not be enough for you. We know that top research, and by top you can define it as you will, across many vectors, traditional or, not, or more broadly conceived, um, those papers are actually being published in, in many, many different venues, um, many of them being the, the journals represented here today. So as a researcher, I wouldn't accept the fact that only the specific journals in your field will be will be publishing the type of research that will fit your needs the best. Because in fact, many of your research needs aren't even in the specific subspecialty that you're working in, right? We are seeing an explosion of interdisciplinary work. Um, these fields are growing and, and, and coming into the world every single day. So uh, that then poses, alongside the explosion of content now being pushed into the world, a, a huge problem. And like we, Pete was saying, 
as and as well as Marianne, you know, this is this is going to be at the end of the day, it's going to have to be some multi, some multiple set of solutions that involve both human curation, sorry, as well as um, machine automated recommendations um, that uh, make use of any set of um, metadata mashups, algorithmic, you know, cool stuff that has not yet been invented. So um, all of those of you who are tool makers, you know, there's a <laughs> lot of opportunity in this area. I think, yeah, so, and, and your specific question is like, what do I do today? I mean, mm -hmm. it is, it's interesting, yeah. <laughs> potentially 10% of the literature is in this state and growing, and those tools don't yet exist. They haven't yet been invented to the, you know, to the quality you need yet, so it's, uh, it's a tough one. Okay. So, Anderson, you're a scientist. So, but I think it's also true that, um, I mean, I still, I still read Science and Nature. I don't read it so much for the articles, because I get my articles exclusively through search. I read it for the commentary. I read it for their news gathering ability. It's just like I still read newspapers, even though I can pretty much get whatever I want directly from the AP. So I think that there's always going to be value-added services that people might be willing to pay for. They're just not access to the content itself. That, I think, needs to go to this other level that we're talking about. But I think, as Peter said, there's, there's a lot of opportunity around this. Some people's business models will be disrupted, but new business models, just like in the music industry and other places, will come into play. And this sort of proxy, I think, I don't know if you've ever read um, Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen, but if you haven't, it's a really good book to sort of say, you know, there's our sort of relationship to expertise and others is going to change. You need the expertise that you need when you need it. You may not need it all the time. And this new sort of network platform allows you either new tools, but also access to expert opinions. So every single day I get 10 digests in there from all around the world of things that people think that I think should be important. And I read those. And that's how I sort of keep up on the, on the general news. But I don't think that that should be... I don't think that should be confused with this, with the content itself. That's all over the place, and I think there was just some article talking about you know that a lot of it is no longer in the vanity journals. It is in you know there's some major articles that come out in Plus One, and the way you will find them is through search. You will not find it through browsing through the table of contents of Plus. So I think these tools just have to become part of our yeah. our corpus. And some of them do exist. Right, humans aren't going away. As Marianne was saying, you know, there may be very prominent people in your field for whom they're, what they're reading or what they're recommending actually matters quite a lot to your work and may inform it um, and advance it quite significantly. Um, online communities such as Mendeley um, and or any host of scholarly specific social networks are providing that access. Um, and I, I but only see an ex further development and, and ex um, expansion in that area. So as I look at the audience, I see a number of familiar faces, which mm -hmm. suggests there are a lot of librarians, information professionals, <laughs> archivists, and those who teach those professions sitting in front of us. And I wonder what the panel feels about this world where search replaces conventional structure of browsing tables of contents and so on. What does all of this mean for the future of libraries in the scholarly dissemination practice? And what does it mean for training the librarians of tomorrow, as I look at Sheila Coral, who is responsible <laughs> for that in the city? Um, so I think, again, that, that there are these disruptive roles, at least in Force 11, most of the libraries that, that come into contact here are getting very big into the so-called digital assets of, the li of, of their university. And those digital assets are not just articles and books anymore. Again, they're, they're databases, they're data, um, they're, they're software and, and other things. And I, just from my conversations with librarians, I mean, in the area certainly of curation, this has been something that they have traditionally um, you know, excelled at. But also in this idea of collections, and I've had a lot of discussion about this because coming from my previous workshop, it's like, well, are we going to store all of the data all of the time, everything? Is everything going to be stored? And I think the answer to that is going to be no. You know, it, we will make some decisions about which things need to be carried forward, and we will make decisions about which things are valuable now, but probably won't be valuable in a few years. And looking at, you know, the big research libraries, I mean, this is the sorts of decisions that they make. And they make it based on not just utility, but also on a whole lot of factors that say these are the things we need to invest in to make them better and easier to use. So I think, again, that, you know, where I see the, these, these 
right now there's a little tug of war, I think, in some areas between different factions as to whose problem is data, whose problem is, you know, <laughs> the researchers say that's mine, the library said it's ours, publisher said it's ours. But I think these things will start differentiating out as these other products become more important. There's a whole lot of things that need to be invented around them, which we just simply don't have. We were always limited in our ability to share data. It was a physical thing, and to the extent that someone could come and visit it or you could ship it someplace, you could share it. Now we can share it on a massive scale instantaneously, and we really you know, are struggling to figure out how to do that. But that, there's an opportunity there. I think what's going to drive that is things like PLOS and others when we recognize that there's going to be a reward system for it, that this is something that you will be able to get credit for. We're still early days there, but I think that's coming. Well, my, my usual answer to that question is that um, mm -hmm. librarians need to become, I guess, mm -hmm. information uh, facilitators, information manipulators. They need to become more data data scientist type of people. So I think the role that the librarian played, you know, going back to the, 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 great, the great libraries <laughs> of history, you know, was, um, Alexander. The, 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 <laughs> was a need, need to physically store stuff. And, yes. and you had to have a physical building with physical stuff in it and a physical librarian to curate that collection and look after it. And, and in, the, in the sort of brave new future of an open access, entirely open access literature or entirely digital, you know, content, there's no longer a need for a physical place and, and a curation of my collection. But there is a need to be able to find, you know, to, to direct your patrons to the right places, what are the reliable sources, mm -hmm. how do I find it, what does that mean, how do I connect it all together in, in the sort of ether. Um, and I think librarians are going to have to stop becoming physical and become virtual in that respect. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they already are. But, you know. I mean, I've heard that people, I mean, I was very shocked the last time I went to UCSD library, it shows you how long I've been in the building, that food and drink were now allowed in the library. <laughs> and I was truly, I'm like, hey, all those years we had to smuggle in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's us diversifying revenue. <laughs> but it was also, I said, you know, I'm wondering what's driving this, and said, maybe we're better at detecting the little bugs that eat, you know, eat, eat our books. But I said, I think it was also part of the library reinventing itself, because you no longer had to go there necessarily to get the physical materials, but it was now a very valuable study space. And I've spoken with various librarians, I think Boston University and others, where they're really realizing as they're creating these information spaces. Because right now, as Jennifer said, we, we, the, the human is still very much involved in all of this. And human insight and value is still very much involved. In the, and that's what I like about reinventing discovery. It was the machines and the people working side by side, not one or the other. At some point, a human was monitoring, looking, and making choices. And some people are really good at that. And other people are not so good at it. And those people who are really good at it, I think, will be you know, the librarians and things of the future. Because as you indicated, you're monitoring a whole lot of information. And any you know, sort of thing that you can use to sort of help you get a handle on it, help digest large amounts of it. I mean, I still think collections and curation is, is, is useful. But they're digital collections and curation. Because anytime you make digital information easier to explore and get at and access and understand, I mean, it's what publishers do, right? It, 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 it adds value to it. And that's really where, again, I think this is where the creativity needs to come in because digital objects are, as I say, they're a new beast. You know, they're, they're something new. The librarians that I've come across, I think that there are, there is no group more dedicated and um, more passionate about a very important aspect to this whole thing, which the other stakeholders really don't have as much of, and that is stewardship. Um, stewardship for long-term preservation, mm -hmm. um, um, this desire, uh, as well as knowledge of how to curate. These things, that is, this, that is a particular specialty that, that librarians have, um, which is not as well shared um, as a skill set in the other areas you know, arenas. Um, and I think that that is really, really important. The type of skills in order to be able to do so in this new world era where everything's a digital object will be quite different. And that may be the, 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 the shifting needed. Um, but I think that some of the underlying philosophy and driving mission, I think a lot of it still remains. One of what, But when we move from physical objects, however, to digital things, um, I do think that some aspects of that mission might, in fact, 
um, no longer be as relevant. And, and so to the extent that an object can live not just in an institutional repository, say, at the library, um, but also in the commons, say, in PubMed Central, or, as well as the publisher, and any host of other digital spaces, I think that's something, that is a different type of framework that I would like to see librarians then kind of embrace more. Um, because I think that that particular framework or vision will um, only better their ability to be able to provide um, curation and collection services to their researcher communities. I'm conscious that Peter has to go in about two minutes time to make his car <laughs> to the airport. So I'll pose a question that I'm going to ask the other panelists to address later on. And that is, are you optimistic about the future of the scholarly communication landscape? <laughs> He's always optimistic. And, 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 and it's not as closed a question as it sounded. But say a few words about it. I, I am. Well, I'm very optimistic because I, I see, you know, the open access has been a sort of very single issue battle. Um, getting access to content so that you know you can forward research articles onto your your you know your relatives, or so that you can save subscription money and you don't have to face you know the, the serious crisis that the librarian world's facing. So it's become this sort of single focus issue of just get free access to content. And I think what people have realised as they've done this is actually that the benefits of having free access to content are much more than simply the fact you don't have to pay for it anymore. It, it's actually you can do the data mining. You can open up new routes of discovery and, and new ways to mix that stuff together. And that's the real power of open access content, not the fact that it's free. And I think people are now just realizing that because there's now a critical, sufficiently critical mass of open access content that allows some of these new tools to be built and actually to be viable, have, have some content to work on, that we are seeing this little explosion of you know, creative, innovative companies trying to solve some of these sort of real world problems. So doing data mining, doing uh, discovery tools, filtering tools, um, all, all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I think you know, my, my optimism for the future is the fact that we, we've sort of hit this sort of Cambrian explosion of a sort of flowering of experiments that can now happen on the literature that never were possible before. And, uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be great. It's just going to be different to you know, the established order of 350 years, and that's fine. So, Pete, thank you very much. Thank you. Make sure you get your car. <laughs> I'll wheel my bag off. But thanks. Good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. thanks. So, back to the audience. Yes, the panel has contracted. <laughs> right. Uh, I think there will be broad agreements among the panel, if only privately, of where we're trying to get to. But I wondered if, if the panel had one thing that would speed process along, one policy change, one change in technology or whatever, um, in a very complex uh, landscape, public, private and so on, I wondered what that thing would be, you know, that you would like to see happen. I mean, I'm just thinking back of when the, some of the major funders changed their policy as regards wanting their results of the research to remain more open. I mean, that did cause a quite a perturbation in the, in the overall system. Are there other things, or do we just anticipate a gradual evolution of this sort of shifting alliances and technology and so on? That's a great question. It is a great <coughs> question. Really great question. Um, <coughs> so, I, I mean, I think one thing that could significantly change, speed this up is if the um, academic reward system were to be changed. So I think it's still, you know, there are certain um, areas of the world where you have to publish in a, um, journals with a certain impact factor. Um, and I think that's still fairly universal that, you know, people are, mm -hmm. they tend to pick the journals that have the high impact factors that their PI have recommended. Um, so I think that could be a bit of a black swan. Um, I mean, I think otherwise, you know, without that, then I think it's likely to be a, a fairly well-paced transition. And I think what's happened in Europe is that the, um, there's been a big push in the UK, um, in Austria, and potentially now in the Netherlands um, to, for everybody to publish open access. But that's not, you know, that's not a global thing. And I think also there's big differences by discipline. So a lot, you know, in the biomedical sciences, there's more urgency around this. Um, research has to be made available more quickly. 
in other fields, the arts, you know, the humanities, it's not not going to take the same path. So I, I, I think, and also the other thing is, I think there's likely to be a, a mixed economy um, for quite some time because, you know, we know, for example, that nature and science don't offer an open access option. Um, and so, you know, and I've I know the people who work on those journals, and they don't intend to either. Um, you know, so I so I think for a while, you know, we will see um, a transition, um, but I don't think it would be complete. And unless there was a change to the academic reward system, mm -hmm. I think that would be the single biggest driver. Well, I was going to be <laughs> cheeky and say, other than making everything CC by, which you know, then. Um, makes the question moot. But I actually, Rachel, that is a very incisive point. And, and I think that were we to see the death of the journal impact factor, um, carte blanche across the board for every type of um, professional advancement decision, this means funding decisions for grants, this means tenure promotion and hiring decisions, I think that would be, that would be well, so there would be no bigger extrinsic shock. Can to I the just system. come back on that though? Because I think there's a difference between um, linking the academic reward system specifically to the impact factor and the death of the impact factor. I mean, I think you know there hasn't as yet been um, anything to replace it that's been better. And I think art article level metrics and alternative metrics are very useful and interesting. But I think there's a lot of factors that go into making the decision about the value of research and. You know, do you believe the impact factor will die? Well, I, I think that if we're talking we're about <laughs> what, if the question posed was, what would be the biggest thing that could shake up the system and um, more quickly accelerate um, global open access? I think, I think to your point, well, to build on your point, you're right mm -hmm. in in making a distinction between what you said and, and my comment. Um, I, I that. That I still think. Do you think it has any value at all? Sorry, just to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think it has any value? At all? She was talking about the death of the impact factor, um, and my question was, well, do you think it has any value at all? So uh, let me be a little bit more precise in saying that when I say the death of the impact factor, I mean um, I I mean that the death being the exclusive measure of um, of quality for decisions that relate to professional advancement. And Rachel was saying this may be a black swan. I think that um, may very well be the case. Um, we have spoken to many very prominent funders um, as well as um, prominent research institutions, administrators, provosts, et cetera, saying, no, 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 we would never use that as the exclusive factor. Um, and if we were to take them at their word, that's fine. Um, but you know, the evidence still stands that you know the, uh, people still talk about it. Whether or not we live in a world where it's just the researchers who think this is the case, or whether or not um, there are in fact still decision makers who are incorporating that um, the journal impact factor um, exclusively or in a very significant way um, in these decisions, then I think then um, we would all be better off if that if we were to be able to provide more comprehensive qualitative portfolios that speak to um, broader dimensions of, 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 of scholarly contribution. Mm -hmm. So as a scholar and <laughs> advocate, <laughs> so I just came out of my departmental review meeting and of course <laughs> high impact journal, high impact journal, high impact journal. But I was very pleased that our department did take a broader view of it and understanding that for some um, for some fields of study, the high impact journals, uh, we traditionally think the high impact journals are not the best place to publish, and so they don't publish. And so it did, they did take a broader view. And I did read one article that suggests actually that in the United States, the review boards are more considering of many other factors, whereas in Europe, and especially in developing countries, they're very much focused on just the, the impact of the journal. But in, in the world of, of sort of this larger view of new forms of scholarly communication, basically, I, I agree with Rachel, it always comes down to incentives. I mean, it is the sole thing that, that people constantly come back to. And um, 
And that incentive is going to be at the level of the scholar. The scholar controls the system, controls everything. They control the administration, they control the funders, they control the journals, right? Because everybody comes through in the sciences, the academic labs, and that's the only way you get into the system. You do not come in from the outside. And that is controlled generally by older, more powerful scientists who this is all still a very new world to them. And I just was at a meeting in Washington and somebody very proudly said that she goes, I just go out of my way never to read a blog. And she was very proud of the fact that she never read any blogs. And so it's like, well, okay. <laughs> um, so I really feel that if there's going to be something that d would be disruptive, it is people successfully making the case for these other forms of scholarly products as should counting. And to do that, the thing that I am pushing, which Force 11, a lot of groups are pushing, is a system of data citation um, that is uh, and software citation that is trackable. Because once we have that, what I've heard from funding agencies is that and journals is there's no way to verify whether anybody has done anything. There's no way to verify whether they've put their data out. And so they can put all these policies they want, but until you have a tool that says, oh look, <laughs> no you didn't, <laughs> right? They're not going to be able to enforce any of this. And so that's what I feel we're working really hard on this system of citation that is machine processable so that we can help affect this change. But in the humanities, you could have, this is a photograph of me standing over this manuscript. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if David Cowper wants to respond to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you've been Waiting. raising okay. your hand. Um, related to that, I was wondering, um, it was mentioned by most, if not all of you, that most open access publishing is done in light of sciences. How can we engage with social scientists and humanists to help increase uptake of open um, I, I mean, I think it, it will be a slow and organic growth anyway. I mean, it is already happening that, you know, the, the number of articles that we publish in those disciplines is growing faster. The growth rate is faster than life and health. So I think, you know, I think it will happen. How do we speed it up? Um, I mean, there's just, there's just not the funding, really, to support the gold open access. And I think, you know, um, people do self-archive that content to make it freely available, but most journals tend to have longer um, embargo periods for that content. Um, so I, I don't have the answer, actually, <laughs> unfortunately, but maybe... I, I could speculate as to... Uh, <laughs> a coalition of humanities funding agencies, so that the National Endowment for the Humanities and the British Academy and others coalescing in the way that perhaps you know, the, the e-life model in the life sciences has constructed a high prestige open access journal which is free for authors. There, there is no, at this stage, no APC. And that may drive the momentum. The trouble is, I, I think, but I'm not an expert in the field, can you create a mega humanities journal? Or are the disciplinary differences so nuanced that you need, at the very simple level, a history journal and English journal and so on? I have no idea. I'd welcome your thoughts. You've also got a problem with the monograph. The problem in a sense, but I mean, the, fact, the way the humanities work, the way people think and research, is much more extensive. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger, bigger units. It's, yes. it's more complex, more of a dialect that's going on than, than just advancing knowledge. Right, and, and instead of those little small units, that's why I think it's been so essential. And I, I mean, I've heard rumblings, more rumblings in the humanities, and I think at some point it's going to come down also to consumer behavior. Um, I mean, the number of times now where I don't read an article because I simply can't get it, but I read an article because I can get it, I, I think those metrics are also going to start to have an impact. Once you have the data that says if it's open access, people read it. Um, if it's not open access, you know, your readership goes down. So I don't know. I mean, we're... Science and Nature are the two journals, you know, Cell and Neuron, that can, in, in our fields, so they can do whatever they want and people are still going to go into them because they're you know, considered so prestigious that people will still publish in them. But 
if you're not dominated by a few of those big journals, then there's really less reason to. And then once we start going to a search base as a set of a journal base, then it's going to be really, can I get to your information to act on it? And if I can't, then too bad. And, you know, I've not seen that funding pressures inside the library. I mean, the UCSD notes that there are several journals published at UCSD, which the UCSD library does not have because they don't buy them anymore. And we're like, I'm sorry, but that's just stupid, right? <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. And you start to get these sort of absurdities that people will start to say, no, I'm sorry, right? These things should all be open access at some level. Now, maybe, and I don't you know, mean this to be, <laughs> but it, you know, it may be, again, that the urgency, and so the embargo periods may be not as deleterious in the humanities that you can wait six months or a year to get a hold of this. I know the History Society wanted seven years for dissertations, which seemed rather excessive to me. Um, but I think the demand really is going to have to come from the consumers, which right now are us, to say, I want to be able to get this stuff. So one thing that occurs to me is that the humanities, unlike science, is not necessarily as um, global. So that sort of thinking about how these things coalesce are different in the sciences mm -hmm. simply because language plays a role in humanities. When you think about um, national, cult not national cultures, but sort of language groups and so forth, that sort of humanities in there isn't going to be act exactly the same way as the life sciences or right. STEM does. And I think that might also have a bearing on the rapidity with which someone might move, or in fact, if they were thinking about it, it might actually call for a faster migration. Yeah, either way. And yeah, I do want to respond. So, I mean, we've been talking about the humanity associated with the monographs, but uh, I, I belong to a society where the main journal, the flagship journal, actually publishes something like 65% advanced grad students and assistant professors. Because the monograph becomes a platform for the mature self. Oftentimes, it's the young scholar who goes to the journals first in order to build some reputation to get some reputation among publishers in the first place. And the problem with open access there is that you know they're the most vulnerable people in the society, but they're then the ones exactly to you know I mean asked to you know pay the price to get the reach for publication if it is open access, and we really um, uh, represent. You know, people who say, well, where are we going to get the money? And we're happy that the publisher is giving us this money. And you can say, well, we need to be creative to look for other sources, but nobody seems to know in the humanities of what other sources we're going to go to. So I'm going to make a point which will not completely satisfy um, or cover the, the, how large and complicated the issues that you've raised are. But just to say that. Um, there is another aspect, um, which is training and education, that we may w that may have a bearing even more so with the humanities. So, if in fact, um, and and I'll take it as true that the majority of research articles published are by have been authored in the humanities by um, those in training or young professors in, my society. in your society, then they are perhaps more vulnerable in that they are working up to a monograph that does take many years and quite a lot of time. Um, that said, um, they had to build their CV. And to the extent that any of these research articles are published open access, um, I would find it hard to believe that that would not make the research articles more widely circulated for training, incorporated into curricula, etc. If we can also then capture that as a mechanism by which you know they can be credited, etc., that will then help bolster um, their expertise area um, as well as their reputation. I mean, two of the most popular talks at Beyond the PDF came from humanists. Uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick talk, gave her talk about planned obsolescence. And again, it, it, you know, it showed that when you did go out there and you solicited feedback and what have you and did this you know, through an open platform, it was actually of tremendous benefit to her in getting that sort of the preprint server type of a thing. So I, you know, I think that um, a lot of times we hear from the older scientists that they're trying to protect the younger scientists, but they're trying to protect them in the system that we have developed, and that's why I think it is incumbent upon us to start to change that so that we don't, you know, that we don't 
take, we don't fail to take advantage of the fact that they are willing and able to op operate in different ways. It's only for them doing that for the system that we are maintaining up here that causes them harm. I remember mm -hmm. about 20 years ago when the mm -hmm. health service system in the UK was undergoing what was seen as radical change in the training process when junior doctors were being protected by being asked to work fewer hours each week and the older consultants were saying, well, we worked 120 hours a week when we were in training and we didn't kill that many people, yeah. so <laughs> let's just keep it going. It's good for the young doctors and eventually sense prevailed. Um, <laughs> I'm conscious that we are at the end of our time, so I will pose that, that final question that I did to okay. Pete to each of our panelists in turn, starting with Rachel. Are you optimistic? Um, I, well, I am, because I think it's, I, you know, I think it's exciting. Um, I've worked in publishing for about 20 years. I was at Nature before Wiley for quite some time, and it's a really, it's a period of rapid change. And it means that we have to be creative, and it means that we have to find new ways to do things, and um, that that gives you know I find that very exciting. Jennifer, I am as well um, as evidence not only by Plus's growth, but as as well as all of the other new journals coming into being. They're mostly open access, almost all entirely open access. But um, to a point made earlier by Marianne, we're seeing an explosion of what um, a research object is or a scholarly output is at this moment. Um, it's not just the narrative itself. It's the data. It's the software. It, um, they are um, reviews associated um, with the research article. There are versions, revisions to the research article in some cases. And I think that if we build towards um, a network, an ecosystem, information ecosystem, where all of these can be connected, can be made visible um, to other researchers for discovery, um, made visible to decision makers in order to be able to provide evidence for contribution, I think we'll be in a very different universe, um, hopefully very quickly. Mm -hmm. So when I hang out with my 411 friends, I'm always very optimistic sometimes when I go back into the laboratory, I get very uh, cynical. But I'd say over the last year, that is shifting a bit. And I think that part of the optimism is actually due to the real systemic problems we have in biomedical research. And that the things that we had been talking about, just the sort of fringe elements of people who are dissatisfied, are now being discussed at the very highest level. You know, this need to be able to incorporate other forms of scholarly output, the need that all of the data behind a scientific experiment be made open, even just for level, for transparency, and to recover all that dark data. These are now coming in the Lancet. They're coming in big journals, and I'm hearing it discussed at the highest levels of, of government. And some major researchers who are very, very, um, you know, they're the experts at the current system at the Brain Initiative meetings, the number of people that said whatever gets done has to be open, it has to be made open, and has to be made available. i would not heard that before, right? i would not heard it at that level. So I, I think we can't be anything but optimistic. And it, this is being governed partially by crisis, economic, and also in reproducibility, but partly because people are very slowly, I think, changing their relationship to data and changing their relationship to information. I think the advent of clouds, remote servers, the idea that you should be able to get anything anywhere, anytime, was never the case, right, for many, many years. And even in the early days of distributed systems like grids, people were very distrustful of it. But now, everybody wants their stuff in the cloud because you just want to be able to beam it down when you need it. And really, that's what openness is. Thank you. Sounds like we have a lot to be optimistic about. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.